I don't know if we're expecting anybody else, but uh, we'll get going here. Um, I have, as I said, I have lunch with Andy on uh, Mondays at Alessi's and uh, thought it'd be a great idea for him to, he sends out a daily uh, medical question and he also includes one of his photos. So if you haven't signed up for that, he can tell you how to sign up for that. Get some good medical information and photographs. So uh, Andy agreed to participate in the uh, in our Zoom lunch, and uh, I will. I don't. Ha I've got so much on my screen here. I don't have your your bio, Andy. So tell us it, something. I think it's at the end. Get right into it. It's at the end, and uh, let me preface this by saying I do have a uh, PDF of this that I can text to anybody. So at the end. You know, either you've got, all got Dave's contact uh, info, just text him and he can forward and I can send the PDF. Anyway, I will start in a moment. Uh, got my props, baby shark in the water, my cute little hat. I've had that for about 40 years. My name is Andy Malvin. I used to be an ER doc and then I got smarter and now I'm mostly retired. And <laughs> it's a much better life. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I've been shooting underwater photos since 19, I want to say about 1984, when I bought my first underwater camera. And the reason I bought the underwater camera is somebody called me on a Friday afternoon and said, somebody has to cancel out on a night shift at Central Asteriano and you got to work it. And it's like, what? And I hated that place. And if any of you remember Central Asteriano, you can understand why. And so I said, I'm either going to buy a boat or an underwater camera. And I hit the camera shop before I hit the boat store. So that's how I got into this. Anyway, I'll tell you a little bit more. Uh, feel free to ask questions. Uh, this is all, I think this is all my photography and videos. And uh, I'm going to, hopefully this will work and let's get started. And like I said, feel free to interrupt. And let's see if does I can everybody figure still out. Have the, does everybody have the, uh, I lost the uh, your presentation. I have something else on mine. Is everybody else, did anybody else see that video? Yeah. I'm seeing it. Uh, I see the video. Yes. Yeah, yeah, see, video's fine. Okay, the video was fine, and that obviously was a great white, which is always something good to start with. And I played with PowerPoint and came up with a nice little first screen. And we get to see the video again because I hopefully have, we'll figure out how to advance the screen. Well, I've... Okay, who doesn't love a great white shark? And these are all uh, shark shots that I've shot. Uh, the great whites uh, went out to Guadalupe Island off the uh, west coast of Baja, excuse me, where the great whites congregate and eating on nice yummy seals. Can everybody see that okay? Yeah. Or are you losing, are you losing part of the screen? Everybody can see that? Yes. You know, I don't know what's happened, but I don't have your. Am I the only one without the 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 show up? I got to try to uh, call Alki. <laughs> myself and yeah. Uh, anyway, so they congregate every year, uh, and they chow down, and there are a bunch of different boats that uh, go out there. Usually, uh, late summer to. Uh, fall and depending upon when they go it uh you know you'll get the young males up to the uh full-grown females depending upon when they go and this was from the great white pictures were from uh from uh october of 19 i was supposed to go in october and 20 and something happened everybody may remember that but i am supposed to go again this october and there may be a spot left anybody wants to go play uh and sometimes they call us the paparazzi of the deep for obvious reasons that little <laughs> that little uh sentence underneath was snuck in there by my girlfriend who obviously uh 
is more into PR than me. <laughs> <laughs> That's an authentic photo. Obviously, everybody knows that. <laughs> and then we got everybody's buddy, Bernie. How could you skip that one? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um. And here we have great white and a little blue ring octopus, which is the most dangerous. And obviously, I wouldn't ask the question if the answer wasn't the obvious one. <laughs> and uh, we got great white, blue ring. Uh, blue ring. Small, docile, a couple inches long, Indo-Pacific creature, and they're different variants, and some have a single blue ring, some have a bunch, but it has an incredibly deadly, deadly neurotoxin, and while there may be an antitoxin, odds are you're probably not going to live long enough to get it. Okay. And they're docile and friendly and kind of cute, and when you see one, everybody's like, Wow, isn't that cute? And if you know what it is, you say, it's cute, but stay away. And if you don't know what it is, and somebody posted a picture on one of my Facebook pages, anybody know what this is as they're holding it? And it's like, uh, <laughs> not a good idea, but I guess they survive. Okay, we everybody, all is kinds toxin, of different. Is the toxin spread by a bite from the? Uh, yeah, octopi? yeah, it's a bite. You know, the, all octopi have a sharp beak. Yeah. And obviously they're docile, but if you annoy something enough, uh, docile is nice, but uh, pissed off happens. Uh, all kinds of different sharks. You know, if anybody has ever seen a whale shark, I mean, these things are plankton eaters. They're huge. We occasionally get them out here in the Gulf. I go down to off the coast of... Uh, Cancun every summer and you they congregate there for feeding they eat uh, plankton they actually eat tuna eggs and there are days when you see 50 100 or more in a given area and there are a bunch of boats and they just go out and you go snorkel with them you don't have to dive you stay on the surface it's very closely regulated by the Mexican government because they figured out uh it's better to keep them coming back and keep them alive and they make a lot more money uh, doing that than trying to kill them. And I think the person up here snorkeling, does anybody know Ruth Geddes? She's a psychiatrist. She had polio as a child. So she's got one leg that doesn't uh, work very well, but she had a ball doing it and she was able to do it. And uh, these are warm water uh, whale sharks. And, you know, if anybody remembers the old story of Don Jonah being swallowed by a whale, that didn't happen. But if there was any truth to it, probably a whale shark because they have these incredibly big wide mouths and big gullets. And I mean, these little guys are 20 some odd feet across. This is over a yard across here. Now, I've also been down to Galapagos, and if I can get the next slide to show up, this is uh, one of the northern ones, or southern one. The big one on the right is actually about a 50-footer. The cold water ones, I've seen them over 50 feet, which are, you know, quite impressive. Very docile, not very bright. Uh, they kind of reminded me of... Uh, if anybody remembers the little wind-up toys they had as a kid where it'd go into the wall, it hit the wall, back up, go a different direction, back up, go a different direction until the wall was out of the way. And that's about as bright as these guys are. And David's obviously trying to get online, <laughs> calling his wife. Bull sharks. Everybody's heard, you know, horror stories about bull sharks. And they certainly are aggressive, and they get maybe 8, 10 feet. Here's video that a friend of mine, of a friend of mine, hand feeding a bull shark right off the beach in Playa del Carmen. And from December till end of February, a bunch of pregnant females congregate right off the coast of Playa. As a matter of fact, we're in 80 feet of water, 
maybe 400 yards off the public beach there. And they see us go out, hi, how are you? Uh, they have no idea what we're doing a couple hundred yards off the beach where they're swimming. But we're playing with Bull Shore. Uh, here's one that didn't play so well with his friends. If you can see that nice little bite mark. And these get within a couple of feet of you. This one was probably less than two or three feet away from me. Little adrenaline rush, but uh, wasn't really scared. This is an epaulette or cookie cutter shark. This is about a two, two and a half foot shark, Indo-Pacific. And they're kind of docile, but they do bite. And the mouth actually leaves a nice little mark that looks like it came from a cookie cutter. Uh, mm -hmm. Here is, we're, this is a group that's experiencing the bull shark feeding. And you see they're all kind of hanging onto a rope. And because the guy who does it, and you've actually seen the guy on Shark Week. Uh, but since he was a friend of mine, me and my buddies uh, were pretty experienced. And he's like, just don't get between me and the bull sharks when I'm feeding them. But other than that, go anywhere. So you got all these people who are paying a lot of money to experience it. And this guy makes enough money feeding bull sharks uh, for about three months that he spends, his wife is Austrian, so he spends most of the summer in Austria, and then the rest of the time figuring out other ways to spend his money. And hopefully that caption came out, the buffet line. And this is Octavio, and you see he's wearing uh, chain mail. Huh. And, you know, so, I mean, the, the shark bites, uh, won't, you know, you can get a crush injury, but it's not going to penetrate the sh chain mail. And it's pretty orderly. And you see this top pitcher, he's kind of pushing the shark away, hand to nose, and he's not really concerned. This is a pregnant female. You see the big belly. Uh, and uh, it's just kind of cool stuff. I'm hoping to do it again this January, make an annual trip out of the deal. Then you got your more common sharks. You know, everybody's seen nurse shark. They're pretty docile. They don't do much. You usually see them laying around under a rock or a ledge or something. Then your more common reef sharks, which are everywhere and every, they're different variants and you can see them all over the world. This one's actually eating a lionfish and somewhere I got video of him chowing down. And these get, to, you know, six, seven feet long, and they don't bother you, but they're kind of scary to look at, especially if you've never seen one. Uh, Wobegongs are Indo-Pacific uh, shark. I've seen them in Australia, Indonesia, some other places over there, Philippines. They're also called the carpet sharks, and they got this fringe under uh, their chin and they just kind of lay there and uh, don't do much. And sometimes they swim around, not very aggressive unless you put your hand in front of their, your mouth or their mouth. And then it might want to see how your hand tastes. Uh, I like this, this one I did another version of, of the caption, don't look, oh, I did put it here, don't look back. That's a hammerhead taken in Galapagos, and they're just everywhere, and they congregate hundreds of them. Uh, these pictures aren't my usual quality because my first dive in Galapagos, and it's one of those things that every underwater photographer uh, has happened, is you get a flood. And my very first dive there, my camera flooded, which was rather annoying, but so I borrowed a point and shoot for somebody for these. But hammerheads can be big, they can be aggressive, and you certainly have to be wary. But where I was, they were just schooling around doing their thing. Uh, back to the great whites, you see where uh, they're in cages. They lower the boat I was on had a total of five cages. Two, they were at the surface, and you just climb in and out. And three, they lower down to about 25, 30 feet. And until recently, you could actually get out of the cage and take pictures. And I would have been more than happy to get out of the cage and take pictures. But the Mexican government said, no, no, no. So I said, okay. 
So I had to take my shots from the inside of the cage. This one, as you can see, he's got his uh, mouth wrapped around the bars of a cage. And when he hit that cage, you could hear the clang like you wouldn't believe. This one, somebody's got tuna chunks lowered from the surface and he's about to go have a little tuna snack. It's certainly a nice adrenaline rush. And uh, this one, not a good picture because of all the silt in the water, but he was within a foot of me with that nice open mouth, so I kept it. This one is, he's going after something on the surface. And this one got the nickname Maze for whatever reason. This is about a 12 foot female. And as you can see, one of her friends didn't play so well with her, or she didn't play so well with her friends. And uh, mantas are very cool. Mantas are probably of the of the big animals are my favorites. They're big. They're actually very intelligent. They'll interact with you. They're friendly. Let's see if I can get this video to play. This guy is about seven meters across. This is an oceanic mantas, and they're different types. The oceanic mantas are the really big ones. And they get to be maybe seven, eight meters across. And then you got your reef manas, which, you know, maybe 10, 12 feet. If anybody has done the night dive off the airport in Kona, those are the reef manas that get maybe, uh, you know, 10, 12 feet across, which if you ever have the opportunity to either dive or snorkel off the airport in Kona at night with the manas, it is one of the most awesome dives I've ever done. Where is that? Uh, off, right off the airport in Kona, and there are a couple of dive operations that do Where's it. Kona? Uh, Hawaii? Hawaii, yeah. Big Island? Yeah, the Big Island. It's right off the airport, and there are a bunch of operators that do it. You can either dive it in 50 feet of water, and they put these lights up to attract the plankton, or... Uh, you can and you can dive or you can snorkel and you can see just as much snorkeling and i had a bad decompression accident in 2011 and so when i went to kona right after that i wasn't cleared to be diving so i went and snorkel where all my friends dove actually the guy i was snorkeling with was a guy with bad parkinson's and he wasn't cleared to dive so we had fun snorkeling. And uh, does that mantis tail, does it sting or does it have any toxic? No, it doesn't sting. It could no. sting, I guess, but nobody's ever been stung by a manta. Most stingray stings, you end up having to step on the stinger and it comes up and nails you. I mean, it's capable of stinging. And to be honest with you, I don't know if it has any venom in it, but. Uh, it's, I'm sure it does. Here's one, you know, you got the big open mouth. They're again, plankton eaters, not carnivorous. And uh, very cool stuff. This T on the back with the black and white, and I've seen, I've got somewhere, I got video of the all black one. This T seems to be uh, pathognomonic, ooh, I use the medical term, CMA, uh, for uh, the oceanics as opposed to the reef manas. Then from the big to the small, pygmy seahorses. This is a Denise, or no, excuse me, a Barbagante pygmy seahorse. And this thing is the hardest picture in the world to take because it's well camouflaged, it's moving, you're moving, and you can't see it. And if you get, as you get old enough to afford one of these really expensive Indo-Pacific dive trips, your eyes are gone. <laughs> and you can't see anything that's small. This guy was maybe seven, eight millimeters long, which is not very big, and it blends. And I used all my uh, skills to get the picture and then make, when I was processing it, make the contrast uh, come out so you could actually see it. And here's, this is another species. It's called a Denise, and there are about a half dozen pygmy species. And they're all about the same size. And like you see, there's the 
coral, it lives on and blends in pretty well. Same with this one, same species. And they're just neat and they're rare and they're hard to find. Then, you know, seahorses are real cool. You got your run of the mill seahorses. This is a uh, thorny seahorse. This is a common seahorse. And to be honest with you, I can't see what this is, but I think it's uh, another variant of common seahorse. But the uh, pictures of all the people are obscuring it from what I can see. Uh, relatives are seahorse, again, really cool. This is an ornate ghost pipe fish. This stuff is Indo-Pacific. And the stuff is just so much more colorful than the Caribbean, you get spoiled. This, the male is, uh, this is the head, this is the tail, these are the fins. Uh, this is the male, which is significantly smaller than the female. Here's another color variant of the ornate ghost. And this is a different variant. It looks kind of like a big leaf floating around. This is the Alameda <laughs> ghost pipefish. And there are a couple of other variants, but these are uh, kind of some of the common ones. Uh, other seahorse relatives. This is a pipe horse, which looks like, you know, if you look at it, it's pretty small. It's a few inches long and it blends in with the seaweed. And then you realize that seaweed is moving around. There's the eyes, the nose, the tail. It wraps around the seaweed. This is a uh, banded uh, pipefish with the head and the tail. Uh, again, seahorse uh, relatives. Here's one that is not a fish. And everybody has heard about sea snakes and they're different varieties. And this is a banded sea snake or a sea crate. And fortunately they're docile because these are up among the uh, top deadliest snakes in the world. I mean, the brown sea snake, the brown and the olive, they get to be close to two meters long and they don't have fangs, but they can be aggressive, particularly when annoyed. And like coral snakes here, where the small teeth just secrete the venom, they'll start chewing on you and uh, you hope that somebody can get you to some antivenom real quickly or uh, it's a neurotoxin and you will be dead, paralyzed and dead. Uh, I watched a brown, the first sea snake I ever saw was a brown sea snake and I watched it chew on the dive booty of a girl that was uh, on the same dive as me. And I'm like, I hope there's no space between the booty and her skin. Or she's dead. Uh, and you see these in the Indo-Pacific and they obviously, because they're uh, regular reptiles, they come up to the surface and breathe. I don't have a good picture in this group of the tail, but the tail actually looks like a paddle. Steve, it's, you, you know, it's question? interesting. It has that uh, black streak that from its eye back, uh, the Zaro yeah. mass, they call it with water moccasins. And yeah. Poisonous well, this snakes is, tend uh, to have that. You know, this is like, you know, the water moccasin is a crotolidia and, and like the uh, cotton, the cotton mouse, copper cotton heads, mouth. that kind of stuff. And this is more along the elliptidia, like uh, the coral snake hmm. with the round, they still have the rounded eye, but you're right. They got the streak, the rounded head, rounded eye. But if you see a real snake in the water and it's like 30 feet underwater, assume it's poisonous till proven otherwise <laughs> so what was what was the girl doing that made the snake attack her just happened to be in the snake's territory and he saw this nice little foot and said eh, let me chew on it Might so be they tasty. weren't quite so docile then uh the browns and the olives are not as docile as the uh, striped okay and i think there there's a couple more variants i'm just drawing a blank now i mean the I've seen browns, I've seen olives, but the ones I've seen most of is the banded. And they're shy. I mean, they'll swim away from you if they see you, usually. Uh, barracudas, everybody sees, if anybody's been out in the Gulf, we have great barracudas here. They got nice sharp teeth. They can actually make a nice surgical incision and in whatever uh, they chew on. Uh, unlike sharks, which more of a tearing motion, this is a, a school of striped barracudas, 
Barracudas are not necessarily aggressive to humans, but if they see something shiny, they think it's a bait fish, and I've seen it strike. I was actually doing a night dive many years ago, and the light reflecting off the dive master uh, attracted a barracuda, and it reflected off his mask, and the barracuda came right for his face and knocked off his face mask, which kind of scared the hell out of him as you might imagine. But, uh, you know, they eat fish. Uh, they're not aggressive, but they can't, they are not, they don't attack people as a rule, but they can be kind of scary because they'll get in your face. Uh, does anybody besides uh, Dave know Dick Goldberger? And Steve, I forgot Steve, huh, Steve? Uh, many years ago, we were diving out in the Gulf and there was about a six foot barracuda that kept coming after Dick and finally forced him. It just got in his face and finally forced him into a crevice on the wreck we we're diving. You know, you don't think about it, but uh, just a little concerning. Uh, angelfish, there are a million variants of angelfish. We have French and grays and queens out here on the Gulf. Uh, we got. These are Indo-Pacific, the blue girdle, the mask, the yellow mask. This is a striped angelfish. Uh, the colors are phenomenal. And a lot of times you see them in pairs. Frogfish, we got frogfish here. I've seen them in the Caribbean. These are Indo-Pacific ones. This one is a pygmy hairy. Uh, that's probably thumbnail size. You can see the fringe and cilia, and this is uh, another hairy one. This was actually in the Philippines. This is the mouth of a big black frogfish, and they kind of sit there, and something comes by, and they eat it. You know, it comes right in front of its mouth. They open the mouth real wide, throw out the tongue, and suck it back in, and add a snack. You know, client, clown frog, pink uh frog. Uh, most of these are Indo-Pacific variants. We got now we got at Nemo. Everybody loves Nemo and they usually, you know, they're shy. They live within sea anemones or anemone fish or clown fish. Uh, this is a pink. There's another variant that looks very similar called a striped or skunk. This is a clown fish and they you know, they, anemones have uh, little nematocysts and they're toxic, but the clownfish uh, secrete mucus on their skin. And so they seem to be immune to it. And, you know, the anemones kill something, the clownfish eat the scraps, except in Nemo where they would never do such a thing. And I kept looking for one with a stunted uh, fin, never could find it. Red and back, a name, anemone fish, common clownfish, or Nemo. This is tomato because it's tomato colored. Uh, all kinds of variants. Cuttlefish, which are kind of fascinating to me. These are related to octopi. And this happens to be a sepia cuttlefish. And they change co colors. And it's all neuromediated. And I was actually with... Uh, this guy from Woods Hole Marine Laboratory who was studying these color changes with this like zillion dollar spectro camera, camera thing that was just pushing through the water annoying all the other divers and trying to get color changes of the cuttlefish. But they're kind of neat and they uh, swim around here. This one is actually the same one as that one. It just gone through a color change to blend in uh, and you see, the, the, this is blending in with the background, but they, you know, can change colors like octopi and squid. Uh, pygmy cuttlefish is about a four-incher. They kind of tool around the bottom doing their little thing. Everybody loves turtles. I don't know why. I mean, people will drown themselves to get a good turtle shot. Don't ask me why. Here's hawksbill, very common out in the Gulf and pretty much everywhere. They're air breathers. This is a big loggerhead. And to give you an idea how big this one is, this, is, this guy is about 6'5". And let me see if the video works. 
and we were out off West Palm uh, shooting these, and thing was just towing around. It'll come up to the surface after a while, but just doing its little thing. Okay, enough for turtles. Let's see if I can advance the slide. Hopefully, everybody likes mores and ribbon eels and things like this. This is a uh, ribbon eel, which is relative to the more. It's an Indo-Pacific variant. The black ones are actually the juveniles, and they can differentiate uh, into either male or female, uh, you know, either or as they reach adulthood. And then the female is the blue with the yellow nose. The male actually turns pure yellow. And I didn't, when I was putting this together, I didn't have a good yellow shot. So you got a juvenile and a female and they're kind of neat. They're not aggressive. They're very shy, but obviously they're looking for a fish or some tasty morsel to come by so they can chow down on. Uh, sailfish. And, you know, these are the fastest fish in the sea. And, uh, and you see this, this is a school of sardines. And what they do is when they're feeding is a group of sailfish, and I'm sure you've seen a video, but the sailfish actually herd the sardines and they kind of cooperate to take pot shots at the sardines. And this particular group of sardines was about, four or five times bigger before they started getting picked off one by one. And I go down, I've gone down off the coast of Isla Maharas about 40 miles out. And you spend a day getting the crap knocked out of you at sea, trying to get some good sailfish pictures, which is challenging to say the least. And you can see here's part of the sailfish school. Here's snorkeler going down, trying to get a shot. You can see the sharp nose and, they generally don't attack you, but they could. And technically, this is really not the end, but I still, get, if you want me to go further, I got some, actually some pretty good stuff. If you guys don't fall asleep, that's a grouper. Uh, <clears throat> uh, juvenile bog color parrotfish. This grows up into a... Uh, parrotfish and everybody's seen a parrotfish uh common reef squid and they change colors and these are all over the caribbean and everywhere else and they school and they're kind of neat and they're tasty nudie branches are basically sea snails without the shells this is the pikachu variant for obvious reasons and they just kind of crawl around and do their little thing and if you don't know the name of a nudie branch, if you just say it's a Chromodorus, you're probably safe because most of the nudie branches are some variant of the Chromodorus species. And these are diff different variants. This one actually gets to be fist size. And this was taken off the Philippines. Uh, stingrays, we got them everywhere. This is a common stingray. You know, you don't step on them. Blue spotted stingray, a more Indo-Pacific variant. Southern stingray, you know, don't step on them. You won't get sting. If you get stung, hot water deactivates the venom, but it still hurts like hell. Crocodile fish, you're going, what's in this picture? If you look here and it looks like a cro crocodile, they blend in pretty well. That's a head. That's an eye. Oop, sorry. Uh, again, another Indo-Pacific fish. That's a tail. You can get a little better idea from the head-on shot. And yeah, just kind of cool stuff. Mandarin fish, hard to get a picture of. They come up at dusk, they live in rubble. And they come up at dusk, they mate for about three seconds and go back down and you're like, where did they go? I didn't get a picture. And the last time I was shooting Mandarin fish, everybody was getting pissed at me because you must have hogged the spot where they all were because, uh, we're not getting any pictures. And I'm like, well, I know how to take the pictures. They're everywhere. <laughs> and, you, you know, if you focus a red light rather than a bright spotlight, uh, it doesn't scare them away. They come up, you got to be ready to shoot. And uh, they're kind of neat. Uh, neat and fast. Uh, mores, you know, unlike in the movie The Deep, 
they're really pretty shy, though if you put your hand in their mouth, they will bite down on you. Dragonet, which is actually related to the uh, mandarin fish, there's his mouth. These kind of hang out on the bottoms and they got the kind of hairy dorsal fins and there are all kinds of variants, different moray variants. This is a sharp tail eel, which a lot of people think is a sea snake, but it is actually a fish, it's an eel. Uh, spotted morays, uh, yellow moray, yellow spotted box fish, box fish. These don't move very fast, but they're kind of cute and good to take pictures and they change colors as they age. Uh, trigger fish, you know, this is the clown variant. There are all kinds of different variants, Titan, Queen. The, we have these out in the Gulf and uh, the Caribbean. You know, the more typically more colorful fish seem to be the Indo-Pacific ones. Sperm whales. Has anybody seen the National Geo Series on uh, whales that just came out with Brian Scary. Yes, it's wonderful. Well, these are in Brian's video. I actually took these pictures before Brian went out there. And I kind of know Brian and gave him a heads up on how the game is played. And this, these are off the island of Dominica, which is Southern Carib Caribbean, not to be confused with Dominican Republic. And it's near St. Lucia and Guadalupe and that area. And there is a resident population of sperm whales of about 250 sperm whales that hang out in that general area year round. And then the males go to the Azores uh, when they're about nine, you know, eight, nine, ten years old and stay in the Azores uh, till they're socially and sexually, but mostly socially mature, late teens, early 20s, and then they come back for mating season. Females get to be about 30, 35 feet. The males can be 55 to 60 feet. You know, again, think of a school bus. They're air breathers. Uh, this is a full-grown female, and the females, they live in family groups. This is, these are two young calves here. And you can see the wrinkles on the skin. It's relatively young and that's the wrinkles from birth. And this is shot actually, I think I got a magazine cover in Australia out of when I kind of cropped it down. To get in the water with sperm whales is not like, oh, I'm here, let me jump off the boat. But it's very highly regulated. They allow only so many permits a year. Permits used to be a thousand bucks, then they figured, found out they had a tourist attraction, then they went to 1500, and now I think it's about 2500 for a week long permit, and then you got to charter the boat, the captain, etc. But they're very docile. A lot of the groups actually, and you can identify the groups uh, that like interacting with humans. I mean, they like, they're incredibly big puppy dogs. There was one sperm whale that was rescued from some fishing net by uh, one of the locals. And it got to the point when it saw its boat pull over, he would come over like a puppy dog wanting to be patted and fed. And that's part, and his family group actually uh, got to be, you know, even after he left and matured and left, uh, his family group still loves interacting with humans, and that was one of the groups that uh, Brian Scarry focused on in his uh, documentary. Uh, it, and they're incredibly intelligent. I was in the water with uh, a mother and some calves, and the mother obviously thought we were too close to the calf, one of the calves, and so she turned 90 degrees, so she was facing or her tail was facing away from us and slapped the water to let us know we were too close and did it in such a way to let us know to get out of the way, but not to hurt us. And as you can see, this one is just, somebody was actually picking a, this guy was actually picking a uh, scrap of squid from the female's mouth. And they'll, sperm whales will dive down and figure Every 10 feet of length, they'll, they can dive down 
Uh, so a 30 foot whale will stay down 30 to 40 minutes, uh, 3000 feet. And, but they can use their echoes. If the calf is in distress, uh, they can come up uh, very quickly to rescue the calf. This give, gives you an idea. These aren't even males. And you see the swimmer here? It gives you an idea of size. And this is a full grown female and three calves. And this is close up shot of the eye. And if you see that line there, that's part of the scar of the whale I was talking about that was rescued uh, by the local guy. And lobster, toadfish. You see these splendid toadfish off Cozumel. Uh, lionfish, it's an Indo-Pacific fish, and now it's all over the Caribbean and the Gulf, and they have no natural enemies here, so they really decimated our fish populations. They eat the uh, fish roe and anything else they can get, so there are no restrictions on killing lionfish in the Gulf and Caribbean. They want you to kill them because they're decimating our fish population. Uh, but when they first got here, they were neat, and you don't want to touch the barbs on the dorsal fins because it is very toxic. Reef shark, I showed that one. He's eating a lionfish that somebody had killed, and uh, it was sitting on the ground. He's like, hey, this is tasty. I'm not going to go get it. Here's a shipwreck off uh, Cayman Brac that was actually a Russian uh, uh, cutter of some sort, and they bought it, and sunk it for divers to entertain themselves. Uh, buddy of mine does not li like being the cover boy for cardiac death, but too bad he was there. And uh, this uh, poster is in every dive shop in Australia and in New Zealand. And he's like, what do you mean I'm the cover boy for cardiac death? Uh, and this is buddy of mine in the shark cage. This is, uh, I think, the last video. And hopefully everybody likes Billy Eilish. <laughs> and it's a short video. Very nice, very, very nice. Andy, thank you. We had some, uh, sorry, I, I lost the screen. I minimized yeah. something, but I, I got it back. We had okay. some questions. Uh, I'll Aaron, be happy to take questions. Aaron, you uh, had, less than Aaron a minute. had a question, um, email. Great photography, Andy. Great job. Thanks, Hunter. And I know trivia too. Yeah, how you do? <laughs> I'm Aaron, all members of the, name all members of the original Rat Pack. Week? Is there any holiday next week that we should study for? <laughs> I don't know. Aaron, you want to go ahead and ask your questions? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that, I mean, I, I didn't uh, understand the uh, actual nature of your presentation, uh, what it would be, and I didn't realize what a nice... Uh, Natural history uh, yeah, presentation would yeah. be. Uh, yeah, let me see if I can get rid of this video. Hang on one second. Okay, that's my selfie. I, I thought it might be more medically uh, oriented. Well, so I used a medical word in there. Yes. Uh, so I was wondering if you were going to talk about the uh, medical risks of. I, you know, I actually have, and I can talk to David about it. I've got two other canned talks somewhere. One is kind of an intro to uh, de uh, hyperbarics and decompression sickness. And I'll give you an aside, and here's my bio for what it's worth. Uh, where I got bent, and one of the worst decompression accidents, survivable ones ever. August 2nd, 2011, I was diving down in Cozumel. Wait, Andy, if I can interrupt you a second, can you take your screen off? Your um... Yeah, 
program okay. it and we, then I can open up, we can open up the- uh, Okay. Oh, right. Here's my uh, unabashed self-promotion. Available on Amazon and Best Publishing, my uh, two uh, books that I've co-authored, cheap, nine bucks, something like that. Let cool. me see if I can figure out how to get this. <laughs> Let's see. Click to exit. What am I clicking? I think I'm clicking. Okay. What am I clicking, David? Go down. Right, enter or escape. Stop share. Stop no, sharing. Okay. Yeah. Yay. Great. Okay. Anyway, good enough. Uh, so let me finish my quick story, if you don't, uh, if you can handle it. So August second, two thousand eleven, I was diving in Cozumel with friends of mine, and I was with my girlfriend at the time, who was a new diver, and she came up too quickly, and I went up to try to uh, hold her down. And while I went up faster than I normally would go up, uh, I was still within uh, recommended uh, ascent rates. And I had, I've got a bad cervical spine with bad spinal stenosis. And I had previously been on a steroid dose pack within a couple of weeks of that. And I had some inflammation. So that may be the explanation. But I reached for the ladder and I'm like, oops, my right arm doesn't work. Oops, my legs don't work. Oops, I've got decompression sickness. So I had them haul me into the boat. I had them put me on oxygen, quote unquote, because oxygen, I don't think, uh, had been serviced in at least 100 years. <laughs> and I knew the emergency <laughs> uh, number for Duke University. So I had them uh, arrange an ambulance in a chamber for me. And I got to the chamber, I knew my own diagnosis, and the other people were still in the water, but I was basically paralyzed, everything but my left arm. And wow. they popped me in the chamber within 90 minutes of surfacing, which was pretty good. I actually knew the doc, docs down there from my, one of them was a friend of mine, I'd just seen him at a dive medical conference, and the guy who owned the chamber uh, I had seen him because I had picked up a patient as an air ambulance patient from his clinic within the last month or two before that. Anyway, six treatments in Mexico. I got to the uh, point I could stand with assistance. I called up a buddy of mine, one of the senior hyperbaric guys at Duke, and he's like, who's the patient? I said, me. He's like, oh. And it was August, so, you know, all his residents knew nothing. I got there on a Friday night. I had a private jet fly me up to do. And his fellow had started that Monday, so knew absolutely nothing. The, they admitted me to the neurology service, and the intern was doing the H&P. And I'm like, what do you know about decompression sickness? Uh, I've heard of it. Okay, let me give you the short version of my canned lecture. And more, I had four more treatments at Duke. I could kind of tentatively walk with assistance. Uh, and then I came back to Tampa and I still had a lot of residual. And after a couple of weeks of procrastinating between all the experts, we finally decided to get more treatments. And I could actually, uh, and I ended up having 10 more treatments over at Memorial and I got to the point and I could actually feel the neuropathy in my legs recede after each treatment and I still got a little residual but that and all the experts have opined on this and it's like well gee we don't know why it happened we looked at the computer printout of your dive blah -de blah -de blah and it probably had something to do with the recent uh, inflammation around the area of my spinal stenosis, but who knows? Anyway, there are different kinds of dive accidents with, you know, type one, everybody's heard of the bends. And that's basically annoying, but it's not gonna kill you. It's, you know, the muscle, musculoskeletal stuff. Type two is more the neuro. There's a whole inflammatory cascade that goes along with it and the recompression chambers and their different tables and I'm not going to go into it here uh 
they recompress the bubbles early on and then later on they seem to uh, work on reversing the inflammatory cascade and if you're lucky you get rid of uh, most of the residual and it usually takes multiple treatments despite what they show on movies and tv and anyway I can talk about that somewhere I got a can lecture on that I got a can lecture on marine envenomations and uh, toxicity and dangerous marine animals, et cetera, et cetera. But, oh, and I get one more anecdote to keep you away from more food. So they're present they presented me at a couple of conferences that I was attending. And one of the conferences, they mentioned the steroid that I'd taken two years before or two weeks before. And in the audience, there was a psychiatrist and he goes, hmm, must have been psychosomatic. And my <laughs> response was an upraised medical, middle finger. <laughs> he didn't know I was in the audience. And I was like, screw you. That was not psychosomatic. <laughs> Unbelievable. So, so, how, how, uh, so how deep were you? It was a 75-foot, 35-minute dive. It was a nothing dive. Okay. My, uh, my maximum tissue load of nitrogen was we calculated out actually the guy who wrote one of the biggest uh, well-known textbooks is a buddy of mine who did all these computer printouts oh 64 percent maximum nitrogen load and your scent rate really wasn't that high uh, that fast and you know bad luck and peter bennett who founded dan divers alert network who uh, which is kind of the clearinghouse for dive accidents peter goes He's a Brit. Oh, tough luck, Andy. Rub of the green. <laughs> you know, <laughs> bad shit happens. <laughs> Anybody else with a question? Yeah, Andy, uh, in terms of combining travel with marine life and snorkeling for uh, us geriatric physicians that don't want to take big risks by diving to no decompression limits even, what do you recommend for snorkeling? Uh, and a Pacific. I mean, you know, if you, were you a diver at one point in your life? Yeah. Uh, how old are you? 77. Uh, one of my closest friends will be 75 in September, and he's going to be my roommate on the Great Whites. Okay. Uh, he's in reasonably good shape. I mean, for snorkeling, you know, the keys are about as safe and easy as you get. I mean, you can see everything you want in the keys. I mean, I wouldn't... I wouldn't do an Indo-Pacific trip, uh, assuming COVID goes bye-bye. Uh, I wouldn't do an Indo-Pacific trip if I wasn't diving. Uh, but where there, wherever there's shallow reefs, uh, Caymans actually has some decent snorkeling that's uh, okay. Again, they're closed till I think June or July. Uh, but I've dove uh, with, there's a guy named Stan Waterman, who is one of the most well-known underwater uh, videographers in the world. He did the uh, video for The Deep and uh, a bunch of the other big, I think he did the, some on The Abyss. He's still diving in his 90s. You know, if you're reasonably good shape, can pass a physical, uh, you know, can at least move around a little bit on the treadmill. Uh, if you feel comfortable, you know, just stay safe, stay shallow, and don't overexert yourself. If somebody's willing to clear you, that is. <laughs> uh, Deb, you got something? No, no, all's good. This has been amazing. Yeah, you know, I try to I try to make money doing this stuff. I've had, I don't know, a half dozen or more magazine covers around the world. Uh I got the two books that are available if you throw my name in on, at Amazon. And people and grandkids love them. They're more for little kids that I've co-authored. Unusual underwater creature, creatures and what is a fish. And uh, unfortunately, I haven't gotten rich doing it. My accountant says you can't write uh, the dive travel off uh, just as dive travel unless you can uh, find a CME course to go with it. So because because you do books and you use the pictures you can't write that off you know how much how much did you ever make in a given year from your calendars <laughs> um 
I, did, I made uh, a pretty good, actually. Good. good. Let me just say my royalties on the books are less than $100 a year. No, no, I made more than that. They were you dying. know how much a dive trip to the Indo-Pacific is? You know, I'm sitting there and any good, any and dive <laughs> equip, underwater photo equipment is rather expensive. I can't think of a time I've gone in the water with less than $10,000 worth of gear, you know. And obviously you're carrying multiple lenses. You got to have an or artificial light source. Most high-end photographers carry at least two flashes. The flash head without any of the attachments are about 900 to 1,000 apiece. You know, the camera, you got a couple of thousand dollar camera. The box, which is just a metal box, is probably 3,000. The little dome port on the end is another 1,000. And then you throw lenses and everybody who does pictures knows how expensive lenses are. Uh, Seems like you'd be a good fit for National Geographic for an assignment. Yes. Yes. Well, I'm, you know, the, I know the National Geo guys. I know David Dubois and I know uh, Brian Scary, who are their two main underwater guys. They're much younger than me and they ain't going anywhere. <laughs> you might pitch the Stras Performing Arts Center to do a one man show. They've done, uh, Brian Scary has been over there a couple of times to do his show and he's phenomenal. But well, you've you know, got a I show do occasional right shows, occasional talks. And uh, happy to do it. Uh, I do have, like I said, I do have a PDF of this uh, with the slides that I'm happy to email to anybody, just te or text actually, text or email, just get whoever wants it to David and he'll forward it to me. He knows how to find me. You want to give out your email address or? Yeah. Uh, Email address, I think, is on the, may have been on slides, but it's Dr. Fiscus. Dr. Fiscus, D-R-F-I-S-C-U-S at msn.com. Uh, and then the other thing is my website, which is oceandoctorshots.com. If you throw in Andrew Malbin, it redirects, or andrewmalbin.com, it redirects to my website, which I is, need some work because it's been hacked by Russian porn, but I think I got rid of all the Russian porn. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> oh, <sure>. wow. <laughs> well, I'm going to sign off. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed right, it. Okay, nice Take talking care. to you. Yep. Nice to see um, you. That, the file, the uh, PowerPoint file, is almost a gigabyte. So yeah, that's but the, 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 the PDF the is a lot more manageable. There. The PDF uh, is much more manageable. You don't have the video or the animation. Thanks a lot, Andy. Appreciate it. Okay. And, uh, Great show. We'll have Mandy on for another one uh, down the road. If anybody Andy, wants to I'll, I'll get all this information from great, you Tuesday David. when I see you. Okay. Unless okay, there's a home playoff excellent. game. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> excellent presentation. All right, we Thank can you. hang on. If, if anybody wants to leave, they can leave. We can hang on for a few more minutes. If anybody uh, um, has anything to throw in. Oh, thank you very much. It's been wonderful. And thanks, David, for... All right, Deb, thanks for coming. Yeah. Thanks. All right, bye. Thank yeah, you, Yeah, Dave knows where to find me at mealtime. Amen. Amen. All right, thanks. Mondays. I missed the beginning, but uh, Andrew, how did you get into so much uh, marine uh, underwater photography? Well, I was always... I learned how to dive as an undergrad. It was one of the... Probably the most useful course I took as a freshman in college. <laughs> and uh, I'd always dove, and I got this call from the ER group I was working for that uh, I had to work a Friday night that I wasn't scheduled to work at Central Asteriano, and I was pissed off, and so I said, well, I'm going to have to spend some money, and I was either going to buy a boat or an underwater camera, plastic. and I run by the underwater camera store first, and I said, okay. And, you know, you start out with film and then you go to digital. And now everything is some variation of digital. Uh, did you ever know Richard Long? Oh, yeah. He was into that. I know. And he, he, he was printing a lot of high-end printings, processing stuff. Uh -huh. Yeah, I used uh -huh. to go to him to print stuff. Yeah, he did. Uh, was they did stuff. great stuff over there. Yeah. He's not alive anymore, is he? No. Or is he? No. 
I think I his, he, think yeah, he, he passed away, and I, his son, I don't know if his son even passed away. Dude. Uh, hmm. People are getting old. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Anyways. I mean, you know, I go to this Monday lunch group with David and, you know, Dick Goldberger, A. Marcatus, and I are the only guys still in our 60s. <laughs> you youngster, huh? Yeah, what could I say? <laughs> well, thanks, everybody. Next month, I uh, should have made an announcement earlier. Next month, we're going to have, I think, uh, C.J. Roberts from the Florida Museum, uh, uh, Tampa History Museum, I'm sorry. Um, Thank you.